Hello and welcome to Network. My name is Spumelele Zondi. Today we have information on the world's first mobile biometric identity solution. It was launched in Pretoria a few days ago. We also tell you why many of us use emojis when we chat. We'll also head to Egypt to find out about an online publication that discusses taboo topics in the country. Our discussion is with Zimbabwe's pastor Ivan Marire, who is responsible for the hashtag This Flag campaign. Find us on SABC Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's News Network at SABC.co.za and email. Let's start with your technology and social media news. Rather than standing in long queues in hospitals while you collect your medication, you can now go to a machine that dispenses it for you. The new machines are being rolled out in Gauteng hospitals. They use a biometric system to identify patients. Matla Kukomane has the details for us. Cutting edge technology to help save lives. The pharmacy dispensing unit, the future of state pharmacies in Gauteng. Patients can obtain their medication from the self-service machine. 12,000 different medications are available at any given time. The machine, when it packs, uh, it's able to read off a 2D barcode ID, which also consists of the expiry date and the batch number. So therefore it's able to monitor the medication that has been sitting in the robot far too long and it's able to dispense based on a first in, first out uh, principle. Patients have to register for the service. They are given a card and a PIN code. In less than 35 seconds, the machine dispenses the prescribed medication, reducing waiting time drastically from as long as four hours to a few minutes. In this machine, you will just go into internal medicine and uh, you will get your prescription there and you will then move into towards the chemist when you the, the machine, there will be an assistant that will be taking you through, but uh, it will dispense automatically. Uh, you will have your identification, it will then take you a picture just to identify, verify, put your biometric, and you will then be receiving your medication. Patients can even consult the pharmacist. Three dispensing units have been installed at the Steve Biko Academic and Helen Joseph Hospitals. Four more will be installed at Alexander, Deep Slot and Soweto. South Africa's IDECO has come up with the world's first mobile biometric identity management solution. It can help banks and other companies capture and verify fingerprints on location. It doesn't need the client to walk into a building. The solution can also assist in the fight against cybercrime. Often, when we're online, we'd be asked for passwords, ID numbers, and other private information. This information can easily get into the hands of hackers and cyber criminals. They then use it to steal our money or use our details for other fraudulent activities. Biometric systems can help to counter that. All these type of point of contact with the customer can be enabled to, to verify and, and trust the identity you're dealing with. But these still require us to go to the bank or other places where machines are installed in order to verify our details. A South African company, iDeco, has come up with the world's first mobile biometric identity management solution. They have the responsibility to actually take their offices right down to the people. Now, now there are many areas where it's not f possible to physically implement a home affairs office and this device with its mobility that it has uh, literally takes home affairs to the people. It identifies fingerprints, voice, veins and eyes. For instance, the iris verification or fingerprint verification is not going to work for SASA uh, in the case where the person is phoning into the call center. There you have to have your voice. But then there's another app modality that could be used, uh, for instance, at the uh, uh, ATM. Then another modality could be used um, for the purpose of logging into your, um, into your network at the office for that matter. So different biometrics is used in different cases. IDECO is hoping it will help reduce cybercrime and fraud. Emojis have become a new way we express ourselves. We use them to show emotions and what we're getting up to. But do we know what each one really means? Most of us have done it and are probably doing it right now. Finish off a text with a character. But do you know what they mean? Um, my favorite emoji right now is the upside down smiley face. Yeah, it's like a new one. I don't know. I like it because no one actually knows what it means. 
most of them I do but some of them I just have no idea what they're for and I never actually ever use them so they're irrelevant to me typically about 72 new emojis are released every day yes you will wait a month or so to access them but better be sure that they are coming your way and there is no manual that comes with them Emojis originated on Japanese mobile phones in the late 1990s and became popular when added to Apple and Android devices. However, most countries have their favorites. We've got a multicultural world really. So to say that certain um, emoticons are used mainly in the UK or mainly in German and then assuming that it's the German culture or it's a British culture or whatever, I think is misleading. I think it's, it's about what's happening in that social context. Prof. Burke says emojis are necessary to avoid misunderstanding of messages. In language, words are seen in the context of a sentence. Okay, so you can use the word green, and green can have multiple meanings in, the, in, in a sentence. So I'm just green, which means I'm inexperienced. The tree is green, which is a color. Um, I'm green with envy, which displays an emotion. So words are seen in a context of a sentence. Sentences are seen in the context of a paragraph. And a story is seen in the context of a broader social uh, situation or context. So you, you lose all of that when you start SMSing, WhatsApping, BBMing or whatever the case may be. And most seem to agree with him. I just like that it's an easy way of expressing yourself. I mean, it, it just, I, I take emojis as a way of um, expressing ideas or expressing how I feel and everything. They express more like when I can't because it's just a face and it's maybe crying or laughing or showing love, whatever the case may be. So yeah, that's why I use them. And yes, you have your favorites too. It has to be the laughing one. And then there's that one with the eyes, like it rolls the eyes, like it goes, I don't know, it does some, like as if you don't care kind of thing. Yeah. I like the one with the twinkling eye, like, you know, and this one is, uh, uh, they'll be crying. Does it mean that the growth of emojis will stop us from using words in the future? Well, does it? Maybe words will be obsolete in future now. Facebook has tested its internet drone and the Pokemon Go craze has hit the birthplace of Pokemon. Let's see some of the top international tech stories of the last week. Folks at Facebook say they've completed a successful test flight of a solar-powered drone that they hope will extend internet connectivity to every corner of the planet. Aquila, Facebook's lightweight high-altitude aircraft, flew at a few thousand feet for 96 minutes in Yuma, Arizona in America. So what we're doing with Connectivity Labs is investing, as we have in OCP and others, in radical new approaches to this problem. And this basically means going to the sky. You have to have satellites, drones, and other things that don't require the massive investments in terrestrial infrastructure in order to affordably provide internet access for this world. The company ultimately hopes to have a fleet of Achilles that can fly for at least three months at a time of 18,219 meters and communicate with each other to deliver internet access. Facebook says Aquila will go through several more test flights and hopes it will soon break the world record for the longest solar-powered unmanned aircraft flight, which currently stands at two weeks. In San Diego in the United States of America, Comic-Con began with the world premiere of the new Paramount Pictures film Star Trek Beyond and a celebration of 50 years of the iconic television and movie franchise. Among the panel discussing it were some of the actors behind the franchise's most beloved characters. We, we've invented through science fiction a mythology, and Star Trek is a huge part of that. So many great science fiction writers had ideas for Star Trek if they didn't write exactly for Star Trek. So in this 50 years, this mere television show and its various iterations have expanded to affect a great deal of our culture far beyond anything we know. Pokemon Go finally hit the birthplace of the mini-sized monsters on Friday. It's arrived in Japan behind more than 30 other countries. The new game, in which players visit real-life places to hunt the virtual characters on their smartphone screens has become an instant global hit. Players in Tokyo gave the new mobile augmented reality version an enthusiastic welcome. The game is just as I imagine it to be. It's really fun. It's also a great reason to go outside, so I'm really enjoying it. Pokemon Go is on its way to becoming the first mobile game to break the 4 billion US dollars per year barrier. 
It's SABC Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. News Network at SABC.co.za. After the break, we chat to Pastor Ivan Marire about his use of social media to communicate with Zimbabweans. Stay with us. Right, it's SABC Network on social media. Welcome back. Now, Pastor Ivan Marire has been using social media to communicate with Zimbabweans. His videos asking Zimbabweans to protest peacefully have appeared on various social media platforms. As a result of this, the Zimbabwean government recently arrested him and charged him with trying to overthrow the government. He was later released with all the charges dropped. Because of him, Zimbabweans on social media are now uniting behind the hashtag This Flag campaign. Let's take Take a look at his first video as he talks about the Zimbabwean flag. This flag, this, this beautiful flag. They tell me that the, the green, the green is for the vegetation and for the crops. I don't, I don't see any crops in my country. And the yellow, and the yellow is for all the minerals, goride, diamonds, platinum, chrome. I don't know how much of it is left, and I don't know who they sold it to and how much they got for it. The red, the red, the red, the red. They say that that is the blood, is the blood that was shed to secure freedom for me, and I'm so thankful for that. I just don't know if that they were here, if they were here, they that shed their blood and saw the way this country is, that they would demand their blood be brought back, this flag. They, they tell me that the black, the black is for, is for the majority, people like me. And yet for some reason I don't feel like I am a part of it. I, I look at it sometimes and I wonder is is it is this a story of my of my future or is it just a reminder of a of a sad past and wherever I go and I put on the colors of Zimbabwe they they, they look at me and as, as if they want to laugh they ask me are you from Zimbabwe? But she's sick. And sometimes when I look at the flag, it's not a reminder of my pride and inspiration. It feels as if I just want to belong to another country. This flag. Now that's just part of the video. The full video is available online. Now Pastor Ivan Marire joins me in studio tonight. Hello and thank you for being a part of our network, sir. Thank you very much for having me on your show, Aspo Melele. Now why did you decide to use social media to share that video? You know, it's a, for, for, for my generation, it's a very natural way of connecting and communicating. And, um, you know, it, it's a place where I felt that I would be able to genuinely talk to people that 
care about my generation, that care about the kinds of things that we're facing. I mean, because for me, I was talking to my, my circle of friends, you know. So it, it's the most genuine way, uh, you know, in, in these days, in my generation, for us to communicate and to talk. So it was very easy to do it, uh, you know, to do it like that. Did you realize it would result in the hashtag this flag and its popularity and the conversations as it's actually started? Absolutely not. You know, it's, it, it, we, we, we call it the accidental movement or the accidental campaign um, and had no idea that it would grow to what it is now. It has inspired, uh, you know, people to rise up and stand up in the United Kingdom, in Canada, in Australia, here in South Africa. Uh, and, and it's amazing to see how far it has reached. When you read some of the messages that are coming out of that conversation with people using hashtag this flag, what goes through your mind? I think it's humbling, first and foremost, to see that uh, people would identify with what I said. But what is exciting is that it reveals what is in the hearts of people. The fact that Zimbabweans have had something in them for such a long time, but have had you know, no ways of expressing it and expressing it in a united way. And that's what social media has given us, a place where we can be not only connected, but also be united. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose social media is part of that um, a bigger narrative for the struggle of Zimbabweans. Mm -hmm. um, and what actually is that struggle that, you, that you're fighting for now? I think, you know, the struggle that we are fighting for, it's uh, the citizens' cry for their government to listen to the genuine uh, ills and pressures that we face on the ground. And government doesn't seem to listen or hear that. And I think doing it on social media proved to us that they don't take people seriously when they talk on social media. And maybe it's because maybe in their minds they think it's a platform where people play games and, you know, you know they just talk things that are social. But for my generation and the citizenry today, it is a place where we actually are talking life, where we're doing life. When we are on social media, it's a virtual reality, but that is actually a real reality for us. And, and, so, and, and so I think th this is what we've been communicating, that look, we, we, we have certain things on the ground that need attention. And if the government won't listen to us, then maybe we talk to each other, you know, and start to come up with solutions. And you were arrested for this. Uh, could you just tell us about the, um, the events leading up to that arrest and actually what happened after that arrest? Well, what we did, what I did is that I um, began a campaign on the 1st of May. Uh, it had, it had you know, kind of developed since the posting of the video that you just showed. And from the 1st to the 25th of May, I encouraged Zimbabweans to carry their Zimbabwean national flag uh, as a way of protesting against uh, the corruption, injustice, and poverty in Zimbabwe. And all I said was, carry your flag with you every single day as you go to work. Don't uh, march, don't chant, just go to work with your flag. It'll, it'll send the message. But every day what I did is that I would post a two or three minute video every day for 25 days and the video was to encourage the video was to bring focus and bring clarity to why it's important for citizens to stand up and to rise up in terms of uh, being able to protest peacefully and constitutionally so that gained a lot of traction up until the day that we were able to call a stay away or uh, what we called shut down Zimbabwe at the time and that hap worked in conjunction with many other bodies and movements in Zimbabwe and so that was a very successful shutdown on the 6th of July. And so, of course, uh, you know, I was called in for questioning. There had been some violence in other areas uh, that had taken place, which, of course, we had not instigated ourselves. And that became the basis for my arrest, which was inciting public violence. Uh, that charge eventually escalated very quickly and dramatically in the middle of court, literally, uh, to uh, subverting a constitutionally elected government, which essentially is treason. So that's how that occurred. And I mean, it, it was uh, about almost 48 hours but amazing how that grew how were you treated in those 48 hours well you know the, you know the the, the treatment when you're accused uh, in Zimbabwe is uh, almost as if you are uh, you know you're guilty uh, I remember you know when the uh, police took me in they demanded that they would search my house they obtained a warrant for it and immediately I was put in handcuffs and taken to that and taken to my house uh, you know, in handcuffs. I, I actually remember trying to make sure that my kids were not there at the house, you know, as I came through. And um, a very uh, um, kind of demeaning process. Uh, but on the whole, I must say that I, I, was, not, um, I was not abused physically, uh, you know, in terms of being beaten. Uh, I, I, was, I was handled well, except for, you know, the cells, uh, you know, in Zimbabwe, particularly the police cells, which are just a deplorable state for any human being to be in. All right. Um, how do you think 
I think the Zimbabwean government um, views the use of social media. Now, we do know that Patras, for example, has um, issued a warning, a, a pretty much a threat, um, about the use of social media in Zimbabwe. I think the, the, our government in Zimbabwe doesn't understand that social media is actually a means by which other nations are building their own uh, progress or their own nations. And this is what we are trying to do in Zimbabwe as a generation on social media to build our nation. And there's a couple of things that uh, um, the, our government cannot run away from. Number one is globalization. Number two is the internet. Number three is technology. Number four is miniaturization. These things are driving economies. And the more our government tries to constrict or shut down uh, you know, social media or the internet, the more they actually shut down the progress of the country. Because remember, we live in a generation generation now where we share ideas very quickly. In times past, if I had an idea, I had to write to my government and my government would write to the government next door, then they would set up a bilateral meeting and agreements. Today, it's just, it happens in Technology a matter of... Technology makes exactly. it possible exactly. to happen over. It's, We share ideas and information quickly and in huge volumes. Yeah, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Thank you very much for joining us and being a part of our network, Pastor Ivan Mahari. Thank you very much, Spumelela. I appreciate mm. it. All right. Thank you, sir. Now, this week, we caught up with a Durban-based singer and songwriter Lelo Green. She told us what her favorite piece of technology is. My name is Lelo Green, I'm a musician. My favorite piece of technology is an e-reader um, because I can download books and I can enjoy them when I'm traveling or I'm sitting at home and chilling by myself. It's a great tool to have. I'm mystified. Yeah. It is SABC Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. News Network at sabc.co.za on email. Welcome back. Now, Kairosine is an online magazine that was launched in 2011. It covers topics that are sometimes seen as taboo in Egypt. As a result of this, Kairosine has become really popular in the North African country. When it was first launched in 2011, Kairosine was no more than an online calendar advertising local events in the Egyptian capital. But today, the publication has branched out to become a comprehensive online magazine, and its popularity has soared. Established by four siblings who were born and raised in the United Kingdom, Kairosine covers a wide range of subjects. The most important thing from day one was that as a magazine, I really wanted us to be as diverse as possible. At that time, there were no publications that discussed politics, economics, business, celebrities, and top 10 bikinis to wear this summer, and I didn't understand why not. So from day one, we went in and said, there's no topic we won't cover, and we always gave one opinion and the other opinion. Amy Mouafi returned to Egypt in 2002 after graduating from university in Britain. She began the venture with her siblings in a modest room in her flat in Cairo. The company now employs around 150 people, including 25 editorial staff working for Cairo Scene. She says tackling a wide range of issues, even ones seen as taboo in Egypt's conservative society, was one of the company's main aims. 
I'm not the one who created the controversial issues. But one of our policies, not just as Kairosin, but as an agency, is to be fearless. The online publication has covered topics that include domestic slavery, prostitution, and sexual harassment. Being online helped in their use of multimedia formats to reach out to a wider and younger audience. A successful online magazine doesn't mean I write a fun article. Those days are long gone. It means telling stories in the most engaging way possible. Whether it's a 15 second video or a video interview. It means telling stories through existing visuals, exciting video content. Whether it's a 15 second video or an hour long interview with whoever. Editors, videographers, art directors, creatives. All right, let's see what some people have been sharing on social media. South Africans on social media have defended athlete Kester Semenya, who has been running her personal best times lately. This is after British runner Paula Radcliffe said female athletes with hyperandrogenism could be manipulated by countries seeking major success on the Olympic stage. People have asked why Radcliffe has a problem now when she didn't, when Kester wasn't doing well. South African Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa has been campaigning for the African National Congress in Tembisa ahead of the August 3 local government elections. He has been trending. And Destiny magazine has been a big discussion for a lunch held with its August cover woman, actress Terry Pato. All right, and that's all we have for you. Find us on SABC Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. News Network at SABC. Don't see does it an email. We leave you with visuals of uh, the Nexo I homemade rocket, which failed to launch from the Baltic island of Bornholm. From me and the rest of the network team, have a good one. Initially, the launch went according to plan, but a few seconds into the flight, it fell back to Earth where divers scrambled to retrieve the fuel loaded rocket from the water. It was not immediately clear what had gone wrong. Copenhagen Suborbitals is a crowd-funded amateur space program. The members of the team use their spare time to build the rockets while having regular day jobs. The 5.6-meter rocket, named after the town of Nexo where the Danish spaceport is located, was the first fully guided and liquid-fueled rocket built by the group. 